As we begin our time together tonight, I would like to begin with a simple saying that you may have seen uh, before. It's this one. No, I'm sorry, I already had it there. There we go. The things you take for granted, someone else is praying for. Have you ever seen that one before? I think it's the first time I've ever read that one. What are some of the things you think of that we may take for granted, but other people may be praying for? Anyone? Water. Water. That's a big one. What else? Food. Food. Daily bread. Hot shower. Hot shower. Anything else you think of? A safe place to sleep. A safe place to sleep. Yep. A job. A job. Yeah. Food for the hungry. Food for the hungry. The ability to go to church worship. Yeah, the ability to go to a place to worship. In fact, I, I remember that in in uh, in Minnesota, we had a family who moved out of our area, and they were looking for a church in the little town they moved to, a little tiny town in Minnesota. And it was hard as a pastor. I was trying to find a good place for them to connect, but. You sometimes take for granted, especially when we're in an area like this, we have a lot of good Bible teaching churches right here in the Highlands, you know, but sometimes you can live in a community where it's hard to find even one. Probably the most significant examples of things that we take for granted, however, are the first two that you listed, uh, food and water. That's really the thing that probably more than anything, you and I, we don't worry about that. We don't think about uh, whether we're going to eat. Now we may worry about what we're going to eat, uh, but it's it's uh, it's a luxury that many people in, our, in the world do not have. Um, we often think about these things because these are the things we need to live. I mean, you can't survive without food and water, and so it's easy for us to take these things for granted. However, as I was contemplating this, I was thinking that just as we need nutrition so that we are strong physically. I suggest to you that there's another kind of nutrition which is equally important, and that is the nutrition of the Word of God by which we are strengthened spiritually. Now, the Bible uh, actually refers to itself in a number of places, and I'm just going to look at a couple. One is in Psalm 1, where the Bible itself refers to itself as something that is needed for nutrition, for sustenance. Listen to what we read in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And, and I love the imagery that is presented there and the picture of, of God's desire for us to be like trees that are planted by streams of water. We need the nutrition that God's Word gives not only in terms of water but it also makes me think of Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 1 through 3 where Moses charges the people of Israel before they enter the promised land to be faithful to God. He says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that Yahweh promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how Yahweh your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers have known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Now, who is it who quotes those same words in the New Testament? And who does he quote them to? Satan, quoting Deuteronomy to the devil. When Satan tempts him, Jesus replies this way and you know sometimes we think about uh, in fact I was just mentioning that on our way back from a trip to the to the coast this past week we were listening to Keith Green's CD great 70s music and now some of you can't get over the 70s part of it that's okay I, I don't mind it uh, I love his music however 
I don't know if there's been a Christian artist since him that has had a more prophetic message. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, he really, he pushed the envelope. And he did it in such a humble way. But if you listen to his lyrics, I mean, they are hard hitting. And one of his songs, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. And it's humorous, it's funny, but he's, he's talking about you and I. He's talking about the fact that as the Israelites, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Life was too hard for them. They wanted to go back to where everything was wonderful in Egypt. And sometimes we too want to go back into slavery to sin or the things of this world that don't fill. But he talks about, if you remember, if you've known the song, manna burgers, manna cotti, but manna... I love that song. But God's provision of manna as sustenance to his people according to Moses, signified an even more important sustenance. And that is the Word of God. And that's the point of that, what Jesus said. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need God's Word to feed our souls. And that's really what this Know Your Bible seminar series is all about. And yet, how easily we take it for granted. You could say it's a victim of the old adage, familiarity breeds contempt. Makes me think of the way it's been used in popular music. Paul McCartney's Rocky Raccoon. Do you remember what he talks about in there? He talks about Gideon's Bible. Or you can think of, if you're more of a country person, Charlie Daniels singing, The Good Book Says It, So I Know It's the Truth. We kind of get this familiarity with Scripture. Even in our pop culture, we see this familiarity. In fact, here's an interesting thing. I remember seeing many years ago a segment about the fact that English teachers, teachers of English literature, are frustrated because their students don't understand the classics. You know why they don't understand the classics? Because they have no knowledge of the Word of God. If you read classic literature... Shakespeare, or Britlet, uh, even the Russian novels, it's good to have an understanding of biblical literature because these authors use lots of references to Scripture, and yet students today don't get those references because there's no understanding of God's Word. So they're familiar with the concept of the Bible, but they don't know what's inside. However, our interest in God's Word tonight is not about being able to understand pop songs or classic literature, our interest lies in the fact that it is God's Word. God has communicated to us. And because that's true, we should take seriously our understanding of that communication. That's what this series is all about. Specifically, the first in this series is titled, How We Got... The Bible, it's the first of the Know Your Bible seminars aimed at increasing our grasp of God's Word. And by the way, just so you understand, the next two seminars, they, they, they each are understandable separately, but in a sense they build on each other because in the second seminar, what we do is we take the entire Bible in one sitting and we go through book by book to understand the whole message of God's Word. And the reason I think that's so important is because sometimes I think you read an individual book, if you don't have the big picture story, uh, it's, it's almost like picking up a, a Dickens novel and reading chapter 38 and trying to understand what's going on just by reading that one chapter. The truth is, this is one book. It's communicating one story. And so there's so much to be, uh, so much benefit if you have a grasp of the entire book of the Bible that helps you understand the parts. And so the second seminar in this series is, is, is a survey of the Old Testament and the New Testament to give us a big picture view of the whole Bible. And then finally, the third seminar in this series is about uh, how we can learn to study it for ourselves. And we get some of that, even from our, our study today, we'll see that the whole point of having this book in our hands is that we can read it. You don't need to be seminary trained. You don't need to be a priest. We'll look at that a little bit later. You can read the Word of God. But it begins 
with this first one. Now, as you can imagine, we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight. Uh, so if, you, if you're all done at the end and you go, wow, that was fast and <laughs> I only caught about half of it, that's okay. Half is good. If you catch half and if you retain uh, one quarter, <laughs> you're doing very well. So take what, uh, what sticks out to you, what, what you can grab onto. Of course, you can follow along in your notes. So we begin with the basic question here, and that is, what is the Bible? And first and foremost, the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, specifically, when we think of the Word of God, we can think of the Word of God as a person, uh, Jesus Christ, and there's a few passages in particular where we see this reference, Revelation 19.13, John 1.1, 1, 1, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Those are the only three times where Jesus is specifically referred to as the Word of God. You know John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning. And so Jesus is referenced three times as the Word of God. However, the Word of God usually communicates communication by God. Now your notes list four different kinds of communication by God found in Scripture. By the way, you may want to take some time this week to sit down with your Bible and look up these references. We are not going to do that tonight. Uh, the ones that are included there in your notes are some great references. So if you take some time, you can go back over these notes, look up these references, see what we're talking about. Uh, however, basically you have four different kinds that are listed there. God's decrees, God's words of personal address, God's words as speech through human lips, and God's words in written form. And that last one there we're going to look at a little bit more closely, a little further on here. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. What is significant at the outset in answering the question, what is the Bible? Is that the Bible views itself as the very Word of God. And, and you might think, well, well, of course it does. But don't take that for granted. There are many sacred books in many different religions that do not view themselves as sacred. At least they don't present themselves. They don't specifically indicate. The Bible is set apart in this because over and over again the Bible refers to itself as containing the Word of God. So that brings us to a handful of Bible basics that we're going to look at tonight. And the first one is simply this. It is special revelation. And uh, that takes us to this slide here. The, the Bible is special revelation as opposed to natural revelation because God reveals to us using human language what He wants us to know. Natural revelation refers to things we can learn about God from nature, whereas special revelation refers to things we can only learn about God through words. Now this is important here because in our culture today, there's a lot of excitement over natural revelation. And people like to focus really on natural revelation to the exclusion of special revelation, that is the Bible. Now listen, I love natural revelation. I think God is, is so powerfully revealed uh, by His creation. In fact, we were, I mean, just the amazing things. We went out to some tide pools and, and to see starfish and, and uh, sea cucumbers and sea anemones. And I mean, these are just unbelievably beautiful things. I looked in one pool that was just covered in green from all the anemones that were inside of it. It's just phenomenal. And when I look at things like that, I say, what an awesome God we serve. However, Looking at those sea anemones is not going to tell me how to get saved. It's not going to tell me what I can do with my sin. It's not going to tell me uh, what God has done to provide for my sin. And so natural revelation is very important, but it cannot compare to what we learn about God through special revelation. And by special revelation, we're talking about the Bible, where God specifically communicates who He is through words that we can understand. So how has God revealed Himself to us? Specifically through inspiration. So as your outline states, the Bible is inspired by God. God supernaturally 
led the human authors in what they wrote. It involved divine guidance and that the Holy Spirit supervised the selection of the words that they used. So when we talk about inspiration here, we're not talking about, once again, that I went to the seaside and I saw the ocean and it inspired me. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about inspired in terms of God himself directing the authors of Scripture in terms of what they wrote. And there are a few significant scriptures that we read with reference to this. I already mentioned 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And another very significant text along these lines, 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That, that's the picture of inspiration. That the Holy Spirit carried them along in terms of what they wrote. And so human authors with their own individual personalities, styles of writing, and abilities were used by God to communicate His truth. The Holy Spirit preserved the human authors from error or omission. And that's why we believe that the Word of God is truth. Because even though human authors who are imperfect were used, the Holy Spirit led these authors so that what they wrote was true. And we read about that in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is truth. And also Titus 1, 2. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. God's Word. If God is the author of this book, we can trust that it's true because God does not lie. And finally, inspiration extends to the very words, not merely to the thoughts or concepts. And this is important too because some people say, well, the, the general idea of creation is what God was getting at. You know, the specifics written in there, that's, that may just be allegory or something. We believe that the words that are spoken are all true, not just the ideas, and that's what you read in 1 Corinthians 2.13. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. God didn't just say, well, here's the idea. He directed even the very choice of words that were used. And so... Why can we trust God's Word? It is special revelation. It is inspired by God. It is a unity, although diverse. And this is really what I think is a very powerful aspect of what we read in God's Word. Consider this. It displays remarkable unity of theme despite the contributions of over 40 men over a period of 1,600 years as contained in 66 books, yet there is one doctrinal viewpoint, one moral standard, one plan of salvation, and one world view. Now, I, I try to help us conceptualize this. And the, the best way that I know how is to go back to Dickens. You know, when you read Charles Dickens, and I love Charles Dickens, I've read a lot of his literature. But a lot of times when you start one of his books, it takes a while to get into it. It's not like the, the, the candy corn fiction that you might read from today, where it's just, it's, frankly, a lot of the fiction today is dumbed down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, Dickens, on the other hand, it takes some getting used to to get into it because he uses language that we're not used to. Uh, he, 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 he refers to things that we're not familiar with. Things that were around two or three hundred years ago, but aren't around today. Think of it this way. If it's so hard for us to go back two hundred years ago, to a guy who was writing for the masses, by the way. He was writing, you know, basically, you know, simple stuff for the masses. If going back two hundred years is so difficult, think about a book that contains writings that span sixteen hundred years. Think about how different these cultures are that the Bible was written in. And yet, when you go to this book, there is one message. There is one plan of salvation. There is one moral standard. I mean, it's really amazing. Not only that, and you think about the different authors, 40 different... I mean, it's hard to get two people to agree, right? 
let alone 40 different people writing in this book. To me, that's one of the greatest proofs that this is the Word of God. Uh, but beyond that, and I already mentioned this, it claims to be the Word of God. Over 3,800 times, the Old Testament says, Thus says the Lord, the Word of the Lord came to, or the Lord said. Think about that, 3,800 times. The New Testament says, in words taught by the Spirit and the Lord's commandment, Peter equates Paul's writings with the Old Testament in 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. And let's just look at that for a second. 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. This is Peter writing. He says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now you may look at this thing, oh, well, what does this have to do? Do you realize here that Peter is equating Paul's writings with Old Testament scripture? It says the other scriptures. If I say the other something, it means what I'm referring to first is also scripture. Peter equates Paul's writings with scripture and and we can go to Paul to also see that we should uh, that all Scripture is inspired. Again, we go back to 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now there's one final Bible basic that is worth mentioning here, and that is simply that it is well documented. Now, you might look at that and say, well, what's so significant about that? That doesn't sound very important. However, it is really important to know that the book that we call the Bible reflects what was written two to 3,000 years ago. I mean, just think about this. Now, we can put stuff on a disc or a CD or something. I have books in my office that are just a little over 100 years old, and they're falling apart just after 100 years. So now imagine this. Imagine you're writing books 2,000 years ago on, on paper that's made out of reeds that are pressed together. And you don't have a BIC or, you know, whatever kind of pen you like to write with. You know, you're using various kinds of inks that you have to blot on the paper. I mean, this is really amazing when you think about it that this stuff that was written two to 3,000 years ago, we still have manuscript copies of what was written. Of course, we don't have any originals. I mean, that would be impossible. They, they would not survive. In fact, I don't even know if you could... Did, did any of you go see the display of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were here? Okay, a few of you. They were right here at Pacific Science Center. And they have them in darkened rooms, right? They have them under glass. They're very well protected because they're old and they can fall apart. And the, 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 what's significant here is, let me give you one example. Homer's Odyssey. Guess how many extant, I mean still existent, manuscripts, copies, ancient copies we have of Homer's Odyssey. Just anyone guess? Five. We have, actually, we have a lot more than that. Now, there are some that only have about five. We have 70. 70 manuscripts, ancient manuscripts of Homer's Odyssey. How many do we have, did I already say it? How many do we have of the Bible? Do you know? Of the, just of the New Testament, ancient manuscripts. Do you know how many we have? Pardon? We have about 5,200 ancient manuscripts that date back to 125 to 150 AD. In other words, within almost a lifetime of, of when some of them were written, we have manuscripts of... Uh, copies of biblical texts, which is really, really astounding. So the point is, it's well documented. When we were back in uh, England last summer, we went to the British Library. Did you say that the Stellingworths didn't go to the British Library? I, I hope they did. Because you know what's at the British Library? The Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Alexandrinus. These are two copies of the New Testament that date back to three to four hundred A.D. Uh, they are the their codex means book basically, 
uh, Sinaiticus, well of course Sinai, so that tells you about the region that it came from. Alexandrinus, where would that be? What region would that be? Pardon? E Egypt, right. So these are two, and you can go, right? Now they didn't let me flip through them, which would have been fun, but they, they didn't let me, and it, it doesn't work very well anyway because they're all, uh, if I remember right, they were Greek unseals, which means they're capital letters. And my Greek capital letters is not very good, but I did try the best I could to read them. And it's all smashed together, by the way. You know, we, we read books, have, you don't have the luxury of spacing when you have books uh, when paper is so hard to come by. So all the letters, they all flow together. You got to figure out from the words themselves how they divide up. Um, nonetheless, pretty amazing that we have text this old. That you, you can actually go into a library in Britain and see a, a, a book of, the, of all the New Testament scriptures from three to 400 AD. And so what are the implications of what we're talking about? What's the significance? Why, why is this stuff so important? It's because this book is the inspired word of God, we should embrace it as authoritative for our lives. Now I want to just read to you from a moment um, from Matthew chapter 10. In this chapter, Jesus sends out the 12 disciples to preach the word of God. But listen to how he instructs them in verses 14 and 15 of Matthew 10. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment for that town. Now, uh, then, then he goes on to say in verse 40, we read in that same chapter, it says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Jesus tells us that to receive the words of his disciples is to receive him. Again, just as we saw with Adam and Eve, Christ's words are an extension of himself to reject them. And when Adam and Eve in the garden... By rejecting God's words, who are they rejecting? They're rejecting God. I mean, that's really the point. It's, it's the reason God's words are so significant is because they are God's words. So to reject God's word as Adam and Eve did in the garden is to reject God. And what Jesus says here is that when people reject his disciples who are preaching his word, ultimately they are rejecting him. And so the implication here is for us, when we treat lightly this book, ultimately we're treating lightly the one who wrote it, right? We're treating lightly God. Um, on the other hand, when we recognize that this is the word of God and we seek to live our lives according to what's written here, seeking to obey it, seeking to understand it more deeply, we honor the one who wrote it. We say, God, your words are important to me. I want to understand what you have written. So, not only should we receive God's word as authoritative, we should not superimpose our beliefs onto it, but allow it to teach us. And by the way, that's what the third seminar in this series is all about. Because it's so easy for us, and we talk about this, you know, you go to a Bible study, everyone sits around in a circle, they read a passage and say, well, what does it mean to you? I don't know, what does it mean to you? Um, the meaning of the text is the meaning of, of the text, regardless of what it means to me. Before we get to what it means to me, I need to understand what it means. Uh, and so it's important uh, that if we want to understand God's word for what it says, then we have to be careful. You know, and it's kind of funny. We live in a culture that's going the exact opposite way. Do you know you can get a feminist Bible that's written from a feminist perspective? Uh, you, can, you can get all kinds of different Bibles with all kinds of different perspectives um, focused on different people groups. Listen, folks. Uh, by the way, I'm not talking about what you can get at Lifeway. That's not what I'm talking about. You can't get any of these kinds of Bibles at Lifeway. Um, these are not, not Christian books. Um, but, the, but the point is, is people, people automatically superimpose 
their beliefs onto scripture. I mean, that's, it's almost cool. It's even like, it's like Noah. It's like the guy who did the movie Noah, the, the one that's out right now that I have no plans to go see. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like he didn't have any desire to even glance at scripture or have any concept of what scripture has to say at all. Um, it, it's kind of our attitude. But for us who are serious about understanding who God is, we need to come at Scripture with the attitude that says, God, I don't want to come to, to dig for gold nuggets. Do you know how that works, right? You flip through Scripture, you look for, oh, that sounds good. I'll you know, go with that. No, I'm not here to dig for gold nuggets. I'm not here to make your word say something I want it to say. Because how many times have you done that? Well, so-and-so said this is wrong, but let me look it up. And, oh, you know what? This passage seems to say it's okay. In other words, we, we hunt in the Bible so it will support our lifestyles. Instead, our goal should be to let God's Word teach us. Again, if it's God's Word, then we should submit to the book because it is ultimately submitting to Him. Third, we should devote ourselves to understanding its content. I mean, if this is God's Word, if this is really God speaking to us, you know, we, there's a lot of things that we spend time reading. I don't know what you read. Maybe you read the newspaper. I know newspapers are going out of print these days. Maybe you, it's what you read online. I've, I've gotten a little more into reading news online. I, I still love the newspaper, but, uh, you know, or maybe it's a magazine that you read. There's some things that you just, can you think of something that you just love to read? Maybe you just love to read Reader's Digest. Or at least the comics in Reader's Digest, the jokes, right? Those are really the best part of Reader's Digest. Or maybe if the, in the paper, when you do get the paper, it's the comic strip. That's what you read every single one of. What, what do you love to read? Here's the thing. If God has spoken to us, there is no book, no written anything in this world that we should be more devoted to engaging in. Fourth, we should live by its principles. We should live according to what it teaches. Again, why? Because it's God's word. And finally, we should strengthen our grasp of this book. Which brings us back to our primary question that we started with tonight. And that is how we got the Bible. How we got the Bible. And so let's, let's dig in a little more on this. We've... We, kind of covered a few topics here, but let's get a little more specific. How was the Bible written? And so, a little overview. First of all, we talked about divine inspiration. Uh, God chose to reveal himself to humanity. And so really, this is the key thing here. God has chosen to reveal himself to us, and he led men to write down his revelation. So it wasn't just for that time period. In fact, when you read scripture, you get the idea that it was written for posterity's sake. It was written so that future generations could grow and learn from it. And one specific scripture in that regard, 2 Timothy 3.16 again. By the way, this is a really good one to memorize. All scripture is God-breathed, and He's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The word that you're looking at here is God-breathed. This is the word inspiration. That's where we get the inspira word inspiration for. But the specific, the, the way it's translated most literally is it's God-breathed. It's the very breath of God. So first of all, we see divine inspiration. Second, it's written using human, uh, human language. Um, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. And we just had this quiz last night at the dinner at the Gannon dinner table. What's the third language that you'll find in the Bible? Anyone? Aramaic. You don't find it that often, but you will find it in a few books like Daniel. You'll find portions of scripture written in Aramaic. But otherwise, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. New Testament was written in Greek. Uh, third, it was accepted and passed along. Men recognized books as inspired, and inspired books were passed along to others. Now this just is, may seem pretty basic, 
but this is just to get, this is how the Bible came about. God revealed himself to men. Men, under divine inspiration, wrote down what God communicated to them. These books were then passed along. They were recognized that this is more than, this is more than just a book. This is divine writing here. And they were passed along to others as scripture. So, and we'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. Let's look at a, at a case study of how the Bible was written. And one of the best case studies that you have for this is Moses, who kept records and wrote down laws. Uh, specifically, we read that in Exodus 17.14. So Moses kept records and wrote down laws. And that's what we read here. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. And so here, here, here it's very clear. God wanted these scriptures to be retained and passed along so that he could reveal himself to man. So these words were preserved as we see. Uh, not only were they written down, but they were preserved. Moses writes a book. That's what we read in Deuteronomy 31.24. And, and also in Deuteronomy 31.26, Moses preserves book of the law. And so let's look at these scriptures here. Moses writes a book. Moses preserves book of the law. And so we read in Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26. After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness Against you. Now, in this specific passage, it's talking about the cursings that will happen if they turn away from God. So it's it's a witness against you if you should choose to disobey. But the point of this here is specifically there was instruction that these words should be kept, they should be preserved, they should be passed along. And so getting to the book passed along, that's what we come to next. Uh, the book of the law passed to the next generation. And we see this in Joshua 1, verses 6 through 8. And that's what we read here. Uh, Joshua 1, 7 and 8 says, Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And so do you see we have a whole pilgrimage here. So you say, well, how did we get the Bible? Well, here's one specific example. God revealed himself to Moses. He told Moses, write this stuff down. And then he said, Moses... Pass it along, preserve it, and then pass it along. And then we see it going to the next generation. So now, after Moses is off the scene, here's Joshua. And he's taking the same book and he's saying, here it is. This is God's word. Now obey God's word and you will be blessed. Um, so this is a simple process. Now it happened differently with different authors. Um, in terms of how things were written down and passed along and preserved. Uh, but Moses provides a great picture of what that looks like. Now, the question becomes, knowing that there were a lot of books written, and by the way, there are a lot of books that were written that had spiritual content to them. In fact, even in the Old Testament, you can read references to books written around Bible times about biblical events. But we don't have those books. And so how did they decide which books would be saved and preserved and passed along? And the word that we use for recognizing books as books of the Bible is the word canon. Canon, uh, the definition of this word canon is the rule which determines which books are in the Bible. Uh, and an interesting aspect of this is that the canon of the Old Testament is affirmed by Christ and the apostles. And the apostles, uh, the canon of the New Testament is aff is affirmed by the apostles and the early church. And so, the the concept of the canon 
has become a little controversial these days. And I don't know if you've seen any specials where people have said, here are the lost books of the Bible. Any of you see any of those advertisements like Discovery Channel? They're like, here are the books that they didn't want you to know about. Right? I mean, they, they, it's kind of like, wow. It's the, or they call them, what do they call them? They call them the, the lost books. Right? The lost books. What's the implication of the word lost? Is that someone lost them. Folks, no one lost these books. We've known about them all along. The early church knew about these books. They read them, however, and said, this is not scripture. (laughs) Nothing was lost. But they decided that they were not canonical. They are not worthy of being included in the canon. And so what is the, the basis for the New Testament canon. And I use New Testament here because the Old Testament canon was set uh, by the time Jesus uh, was walking the earth. And so we have a pretty solid, it was pretty basic, pretty clear what the Old Testament canon was. But the New Testament canon, people had to grapple in the early church and say, well, what, what is scripture? And there really were, there were meetings. People got together. Different leaders in the church got together from all over and they said, okay, which of these books really are scripture and which are not? Because some books were passed around and they said, but we're not sure if this is really scripture. So they developed some rules like, is it written by by or associated with a recognized apostle or prophet? Most of the books in the New Testament, we know who they are written by. And they are someone that we recognize as someone who walked with Jesus. And so this this is a number one, this is a very significant component. Second, does it claim to be the word of God? That is important. Does Does it actually make the claim that it's divinely inspired? Third, does it harmonize with known scripture? Fourth, is it quoted in other scriptures? I mean, that kind of makes it a pretty clear, a pretty good idea that it might be scripture if it's quoted by others. And then fifth, was it accepted by the early church? And so let's look a little bit at the early church and this process of bringing about the canon. Um, One person very significant in this process is a church leader by the name of Irenaeus who lived around 170 A.D. Uh, Irenaeus gave us one of the earliest lists of the New Testament. He did leave out a few books that we recognize, Philemon, James, 2 Peter, and 3 John. Um, For whatever reason, he doesn't indicate, but he did leave out some books. But what's, what's interesting here is, as early as 170 A.D., We have almost, except for those four books, we have a complete canon already. So for all those people who go around arguing, oh, the lost books, and and by the way, please, please, please do not get your theology from Dan Brown, author of The Da Vinci Code. He doesn't know what he's talking about. If you watch The Da Vinci Code, which I had to watch that movie, uh, you know, he talks about these supposed lost books and how they cut stuff out because they didn't want you to know about it and it was all political all the no 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 people got together and they said you know what this is not scripture this should not be included in the canon it wasn't about politics um, it was about people but, but but here's the proof of that is because these accounts these councils don't take place for another 100 150 years after Irenaeus so before any of these councils happened Irenaeus has already has a list that, except for four books, is exactly what we use today for our scriptures. Um, so then we had some synods, and that's what the meetings were called. When they had a meeting, they called it a synod, or at least that's our English translation. The Synod of Hippo in 393 AD. The Third Synod of Carthage in 397 AD. These are all referencing places in uh, the ancient world. Also recognized... These 27 books, all 27, as canonical. In addition, during this time, the highly influential 
church father, Jerome, as well as the highly influential Augustine, both in the uh, late to early, uh, late 300s, early 400s AD, published their lists of 27 books completing the New Testament that included the Philemon, James, 2 Peter, 3 John. Another very influential list of these 27 books of the New Testament that we have today was that of Athanasius in 367. And I'd actually like to read to you a, a list. Deb, would you grab? There, are, there should be three books sitting on my desk, stacked near each other, and one says canon on it. Um, so I'll read to you those in just a moment. I had those books. Um, but what we're doing here is we're beginning to get a concept here of how it came about that it was determined that the books that we have today should be included in our Bibles. It was not a matter of someone saying, well, hey, I like this book. There were lots of books. In fact, we have lots of references to various books that are interesting books, but they weren't Scripture. And that's the point that we're talking about. But I'd like to read to you just for a moment... Um, Regarding Athanasius here, uh, and these are his own words as he lists off what he sees as the books that are included in the New Testament. And this is what he says. Again, we must not hesitate to name the books of the New Testament. They are as follows. Four Gospels, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. Then after these, the Acts of the Apostles and the seven so-called Catholic epistles of the Apostles. By the way, the word Catholic means universal. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic. It means universal. So these are the universal epistles of the Apostles. Say that ten times fast. Epistle is a letter. So these are the Catholic, the universal letters of the Apostles. As follows. One of James, two of Peter, three of John, and after these, one of Jude. Next to these are 14 epistles of the Apostle Paul, written in order as follows. First to the Romans, then to the Corinthians, then, excuse me, then two to the Corinthians, and after these to the Galatians, and next to the Ephesians, then to the Philippians, then to the Colossians, two to the Thessalonians, and that to the Hebrews. Next are two to Timothy, one to Titus, and one last to Philemon. Moreover, John's Apocalypse which is, of course, the book of Revelation. And he goes on to say, and I really appreciate these words that he writes about Scripture. He says, these are the springs of salvation, so that one who is thirsty may be satisfied with the oracles which are in them. In these alone is the teaching of true religion proclaimed as good news. Let no one add to these or take anything from them. For concerning these, our Lord confounded the Sadducees when he said, You are wrong because you do not know the Scriptures. And he reproved the Jews, saying, You search the Scriptures because it is, that, it is they that bear witness to me. But for the sake of greater accuracy, I must needs, as I write, add this. There are other books outside these which are not indeed included in the canon, but have been appointed from the time of the fathers to be read to those who are recent converts to our company and which uh, wish to be instructed in the word of the true religion. These are the so-called teaching of the apostles and the shepherd. You read either of those books? Nor have I. But... If you think about it, today we have books that we would use for new converts, right? Books that we use to instruct them, to train them up. And so in the same way, they had books like that. He says, but while the former are included in the canon, the latter, these two books he just mentioned, are read in church. No mention is to be made of the apocryphal works. So he says, it's okay to use these books in church, but don't include any of the apocryphal works. We'll get to those in a moment. The, they are the invention of heretics who write according to their own will and gratuitously assign and add to them dates so that offering them as ancient writings they may have an excuse for leading the simple astray. Now we'll get to uh, apocryphal works in just a moment, but I really appreciate what Athanasius says here. He mentions three levels of books. First, the canon, which is the same as our Old Testament and New Testament. Second, books that are good for instruction but are not authoritative, they're not canon. And third, apocryphal, of which he has some fairly negative words to say. Once again, it brings us back to the, the hoopla, the so-called lost books of the Bible. The thing is, people make it sound like they've uncovered something that has been lost or purposely kept from the masses. But it's really a lie. It's a falsehood and it's only done to sell movies and sell books. 
The reason these books are well, not well known is because for close to 2,000 years now, Christ's church has recognized that they are a bunch of bunk and are not worth our time. Of course, there are many ancient religious books that are not included in the Bible. And the reason they're not in the Bible goes back to the reasoning of Athanasius and the fact that they do not fit the qualifications that we have just listed. Now, in a minute, we're going to turn our attention to the Apocrypha itself, but are there any questions or comments on the other so-called lost books or on this topic in general or anything we've covered? We'll, we'll, we'll break for questions at the end as well, but just let me stop midstream. We've covered a lot of territory. Any comments or questions based upon what we've already covered? So you're saying in Joshua, where it says, do not let the word of God depart from your mouth, that it seems kind of odd to use the double negatives when everything else is more of a positive yeah, encouragement. Yeah. Well, I, so the question is, what does depart from your mouth mean? It's, and it is a little bit of a strange, strange language, but I think it's used to, to emphasize. And, you know, elsewhere we talk about eating, eating God's word. Um, and I think the point that he's really trying to, to drive home is, is that the word of God should be like breath to us, like air, like, like the food we eat. It should be a part of all that we are. It should be, um, it should be a part of, of our daily existence. Um, don't let it depart. Don't let it leave. Uh, never let God's word out of your sight. And I think it goes with kind of the, the, the challenge we receive in Scripture. You know, we talk about meditating on the law of the Lord day and night. Um, you know, the king is told to write a copy for himself of God's word so that he can have God's word with him all the time. And I think really that's the point that is being made there is we need God's word. It's not just an inspirational book to turn to once in a great while, which is that's the way a lot of people use the Bible, you know. In fact, and to see how serious Joshua's challenge was needed. If you remember, uh, a little later on in the history of Israel, they lose the book of the law. They lose it. They don't have it anywhere. And, and someone's rummaging in the temple. And, oh, look what I found. Oh, look, it's, it's the word of God. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the law. And you kind of think, well, wait a second. Didn't they say, don't let it depart from your mouth and let yet... You not only haven't read God's word for hundreds of how many, who knows how many years, God's word has been lost to His people. What what's the problem here? So I think that's I think that's really the point that's trying to be driven home is it needs to be a, a necessary part to our daily existence. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, so, so the, the, the question is, uh, when, we, when we talk about the Apocrypha, or you talk about pseudo-writings, false writings, um, you could also apply that to some cults who also add in their own books. In fact, Athanasius has a strong word here for the cults who have added to God's book. You know, you think of the Book of Mormon. Um, I mean, that's obviously in addition to God's word, to the word that all the way back to 170 A.D., <laughs> was nailed down by as early as Irenaeus. And, and, yet, and yet people add to this book the very thing that Athanasius says don't do. 
the very thing that the end of Revelation says don't do, even though there's argument as whether that's specifically talking about uh, New Revelation. But yeah, let's so let's get on. Let's get into the Apocrypha a little bit. And and the first thing I should say about the Apocrypha is you need to recognize that people use uh, the word Apocrypha differently. Athanasius used the word Apocrypha. Um, to refer to books that were that were false, false books, false writings. Now, uh, there is a group known as the pseudepigrapha. Okay, pseudo means false writings. Graphe means writing, false writings. Pseudepigrapha. So there are books that are specifically, and so really, the way Athanasius was using that word was the way we use the word pseudepigrapha. He was equating apocrypha with pseudepigrapha. These are false writings that people make up stuff about to, to try and lead others astray. Now, the apocrypha, however, when you use the word apocrypha with regards to the books that are in the Catholic Bible. Now, any of you ever read any of the apocrypha? Okay, so you find books in the Catholic Bible that aren't in the Protestant scriptures and you go, well, wait a second. <laughs> If they're scripture, then why aren't they in my Bible too? You know, why do we have two separate Bibles, um, one for Catholics and one for Protestants? Um, th basically, uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that in just a second. We'll get to how it came about. Um, but there are some important things to know about the Apocrypha that sets it apart from what we do have in our scriptures. First of all, the Apocrypha is not quoted in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Now, there is one possible allusion to an apocryphal writing in the New Testament. But there is no verbatim quote. Other than that allusion, there is no verbatim quote of the Apocrypha in the Old Testament or New Testament. That's significant. Because the New Testament quotes Old Testament books all over the place. And the fact that it never once quoted any of these apocryphal books. And these apocryphal books, most of them were written during what we call the intertestamental period. So this is the period uh, somewhere between three to 400 BC all the way up till the time of Christ. There were, you remember, may remember we talk about this, these are what we call the silent years because God was not speaking through his prophets during the intertestamental periods. But books kept being written People kept writing books. For example, Maccabees. Do you remember what Maccabees is about? It's about the Maccabean revolt of around 167 B.C. Uh, where the Maccabee brothers rose up against the, uh, the fact that they were, um, there was a sacrifice of a pig on the altar of God. And so the Maccabees stood up and said, hey, this is not right. You've desecrated uh, God's holy place. Um, and so that's why we have the Festival of Lights, Hanukkah. It comes from that. It, it's, not in the, it's not in the Old Testament. So it's interesting to read Maccabees, and it's a story that I think is largely accurate and interesting to see God, the way God was still working in his people at that time. But it's not quoted in the New Testament. It's not the same as Scripture. It's like the many other books that were written that are not Scripture. Um, not only not quoted, but it contains many unbiblical teachings. For example, purgatory. Purgatory is not found in the New Testament. Now, you can find stuff, if you're looking hard enough and trying to get the Bible to support you, you can find stuff that might support your idea that there may be some sort of purgatory, but there's nothing in Scripture that's in any way clear or that indicates that there is such thing as a purgatory. And so we find that in the apocryphal writings, in these books that you'll find in the Catholic Bible that go beyond our Bible, that... Uh, that they have unbiblical teachings, teachings you don't find that really go against what we see in Scripture. Uh, third, the Apocrypha itself claims to be non-canonical. In other words, it sets itself apart from, it distinguishes itself. So we just saw a moment ago where Peter equated Paul's writing with Scripture. Uh, now listen to one of the Apocryphal books itself where it refers to the Law and the Prophets as something that is distinct from itself, different from itself. This is from uh, Ecclesiasticus, or the wisdom of Jesus, the son of Sirach. By the way, different Jesus. They did have uh, other guys named Jesus that were not our Jesus. Uh, and this is how it begins, the prologue. Whereas many great teachers 
teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the others that followed them, in other words, the writings. So in other words, we have many great teachings from the Old Testament Bible um, on account of which we should praise Israel for instruction and wisdom. And since it is necessary not only that the readers themselves should acquire understanding, but also that those who have loved learning should be able to help the outsiders by both speaking and writing, my grandfather Jesus, after devoting himself especially to the reading of the law and the prophets and the other books of our fathers, and after acquiring considerable proficiency in them, was himself also led to write something pertaining to instruction and wisdom. Now, the only point I'm trying to make here is, He's distinguishing his book from the Law and the Prophets. He's saying it's not like, this is, a, this is distinct. I'm writing instruction about the Law and the Prophets, but it's not the same as the Law and the Prophets. And so, even the Apocrypha itself, not only does not claim to be canonical, it distinguishes itself from canonical books. Fourth is Jerome's claim against the Apocrypha. And, and by the way, this is one of the most damning uh, elements of this whole discussion on the Apocrypha. And by the way, I'm going to keep it rather short. In years past, I've spent a little more time on this, but I'm going to keep it short. Here's basically in a nutshell. Uh, Jerome, who's recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church, okay, so this is, this is an important guy, and he was an important guy, writing in around 400 AD, he translates the scriptures into Latin. What do we call that? We call it the Vulgate. So he translates the, uh, the, the scriptures into Latin because Latin, by the way, what is Vulgate? What does that sound like? What English word that we use? Vulgar. It's not saying it's disgusting. It's saying it's common. It's the common language. At that time, that was the common language. So people were speaking Latin, so it makes sense. Let's translate it into the language that they were. By the way, Greek, we, call, we refer to New Testament Greek as Koine Greek. Koine means common. So it makes sense. God's word was always being translated into the common language. It was great that it should be translated into Latin. We'll get to the Vulgate a little more in, a, in a, just a few moments. However, here's the funny thing. Jerome said, I will not translate the Apocryphal works. They, they had him say, hey, here it is. Translate it all for us, Jerome. Jerome said, no, you're going to have to have someone else translate the Apocrypha because it's not Scripture. And I only want to translate what is really Scripture. Um, and all this is pretty interesting because Jerome is very highly respected in the Catholic Church. There's a, there should be a little irony for the Catholic Church. Wait a second. Our venerated Saint Jerome refused to translate these books. Hmm. Uh, not only that, the Jews never included the Apocrypha in their writings. They never included it as canon. Um, it was not written by known apostles and prophets. You know, one of the closest things we have to it is knowing the stories about the Maccabees, uh, but it was not written by known apostles or prophets. It was not accepted by the early church, and it was not canonized, by the way, in the Catholic Church until the Council of Trent in 1546. Now, can someone do a little addition for me? About how many years is that from the canon that we have from Irenaeus or Athanasius? How many years are we talking here? Yeah, like 1,200 plus years. That's pretty significant. By the way, the Council of Trent was, was a backlash to what? The Reformation. So they say, wait a second, you're messing with Mary, don't do that. You're messing with the Apocrypha, don't do that. Okay, so Apocrypha Scripture, take that. Uh, but this is fairly late to be doing this, to be saying, okay, well, we've decided. Now, what they, what they argue all along is, well, we always recognize the Scripture. We just hadn't, you know, gotten around to having a council and getting it nailed down. The point is this. Um, the Apocrypha is interesting reading. But it, when we begin to submit it to the test of canon, it fails. It really does. Um, it's not something that is recognized. In fact, I appreciate Jer Jerome's word here. He said, if you want to find something good in the canon, it's a task requiring great prudence to find gold in the midst of clay. In other words, he's saying this is, there's a bunch of bunk here. You, you, know, you might find a few gold nuggets, but it's pretty hard to do that. Um, and so let's, let's step away from the Apocrypha. Any quick questions just on the Apocrypha right now?
Okay, so back to our train of thought here. Uh, the words of the Bible, the, the books of the Bible recognize, the words of the Bible also need to be recognized. And we were talking about this uh, last night. What is the discipline that we know of that where you recognized what words in the Bible are actually, I guess it's right there on your notes, isn't it? So everyone, everyone should know this one, right? Textual criticism. And so that it's, 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 it's a bit of a science, really. And if, if I had my Greek Bible, we have at the bottom of it what's known as an apparatus that tells us what different manuscripts have different, uh, have different versions. And so it, it, they're, they're minor variations. And if you think about it, they started copying these books 2,000 years ago. And as a copier went along, there are different specific mistakes we can catch. Like, for example, there's a mistake where the copyist writes a word that was right above the line he was writing. Well, that, that's an obvious... I mean, if you were copying out a large book, you would do that. You would accidentally put in a word that, that was from a previous line. Or the copyist accidentally leaves out a line. Once in a while, the copyist would insert a word to kind of help us, you know, figure it out a little better. It's like his little commentary on it. Um, so there are different little things that copyists would do. But the thing is, we have all these different strands. So here's one guy writing a copy in Alexandria, Egypt. Here's another guy writing in the, in the Sinai, writing in Palestine. Here's another guy writing in North Africa. And they're all writing in different areas, and they write their copy, and they pass it along. And so we can tell when a mistake was made... Because all the documents that came from North Africa have this same mistake up until this day. And we go, oh, obviously it was the person writing this manuscript that made the mistake. Because only the African, North African copies have the mistakes, whereas it's not found in the ones from Egypt or the ones from the area of Israel. And so that's, in a nutshell, that's what textual criticism is. It's trying to determine where there's a discrepancy in different texts. Which word was the original word? And this, the only thing I need to tell you about textual criticism is there is no disputed words that affect in any significant way our faith. So it's not, well, you know, it's unclear if Jesus is God because that word is the one that's, no. It's nothing, no significant doctrine is in any way questioned because of variance in words. Okay, let's get beyond that. I want to go to where did the various versions come from? And we're getting to the Bible translator's task here. And so the originals are referred to as autographs. So when you see the word autograph, we're not talking about your John Hancock. Autograph means the original writing. So when, when <laughs> uh, I was about to say when Timothy wrote his book, but Timothy didn't write a book, did he now? Uh, Paul wrote a book to Timothy, which, which uh, our family has been happy to highlight for all of you. And so when Paul wrote Timothy, right, we call that original book that he wrote um, the autograph. The copies after that are, are the copies, are the manuscripts, what we call manuscripts. And so we start with the autographs. And the question the Bible translators start with is, what, what are the original Greek or Hebrew words? So that's the textual criticism that I was just talking to you about. That's what that is, textual criticism. B, what do these words mean? That's the second goal that they're trying to, as a translator, you, you're trying to understand what do these words mean. C, how do you express these meanings in the mother tongue, that is whatever tongue it is you're translating it into, with an economy of words. And the reason we use the words economy of words is to recognize that every language has its own group of words that you can use. And sometimes we make up words because they don't, we don't have them in our language. So we have some made up words because there just wasn't anything to translate it into. But I always use the example of, uh, you know, I've heard people say that in, in, you know, Eskimos have 30 different words for, for water, for precipitation. Snow, ice, hail, you know, they have 30 different words to use. If you live in Texas, you may only know one or two of those words, right? Or five of those words. You don't need all those other words because you don't have all that kind of precept. And so the same is true in different cultures. As you go from culture to culture and you're translating scripture, you may not have a word that equates with something that's in your culture. And so they have an economy of words to work with, but they're trying to express the meanings of what's written. And the end result is translation. Um, and so let's look 
so basically, this is the task that a Bible translator goes through. Everyone who enjoys an English Bible here uh, has benefited from translators who did this hard work, all these steps, and it's really simplistic what I've written up here, but there's a lot of hard work and study that goes behind all this. By the way, I'll tell you one other thing. With the advent of the computer age, it's made this kind of work I mean, you can't even imagine how it's changed the work of Bible translators. I mean, it's just, it's mind-boggling uh, that what, what would have taken a year to do, you can do in three minutes on a computer as a Bible translator. So, as we think about the negatives that the computer age has brought, we can also think of some positives. Um, let's look at some specific examples of how we got the English Bible that we enjoy today. The first person, and really on anyone's list, the first person you want to look at is John Wycliffe. I mean, he was the man who, uh, who really uh, was the first one to bring us... Now, now, here's the thing you need to be thinking about John Wycliffe and these guys and even the early reformers. What religion were they? What church were they a part of? The Roman Catholic Church, right? John Wycliffe was a priest, and so sometimes we look at these names and we think Protestant. He wasn't Protestant. He was a Catholic priest. However, he looked at the Catholic Church and he says, there are things going on here that shouldn't be going on. Like indulgences. People paying to get their sins forgiven. That's not right. It's not right that the rich guy can say, well, I went out and had an affair, but it's okay because I got money to pay for my events. You know? That's not right. So John uh, Wycliffe stood up against this stuff and said, hey, some of this stuff is right. The, the other thing that he stood up and said, you know what? Every man needs to be able to read God's word. Every man. Not just those who know Latin. Because remember, Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, the Latin Vulgate. That was the Bible all the way up through the time of John Wycliffe. So if you didn't know Latin, well, you're, you're out of luck. In fact, the masses, even in the U.S., up until the last, within the last century, the masses changed over to English. Until then, they were in Latin. I mean, can you imagine going to a church where the mass, where where the 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 liturgy is in Latin? Uh, if you know Latin, that's great. If you don't, it's you know kind got to be a little bit confusing. But th the point is, is is John Wycliffe said, hey. We need to have a, a Bible that, that the commoners can read. The Vulgate was the vulgar, the common language of that day, 400 B.C. A thousand years later, we need a Bible in our language that anyone can read. Because of his desire for an English Bible, he was ejected from his role as president of Christ Church College at Oxford. He faced intense persecution. He wasn't killed for it, although they would have loved to kill him. Um, but they, they did end up digging up his remains after he was killed, and they burnt them, just kind of a so there uh, kind of thing. Um, but here's the legacy John Wycliffe has. First translation of the Bible into English. Pretty significant. Uh, the second name that we look at here is Johann Gutenberg, and uh, anyone remember what's significant about Johann Gutenberg? The recognition he received uh, even in our world over the last, well, oh, about 12 years ago? 14 years ago? Pardon? Printing press is what he did. Who recognized him 13 or 14 years ago? Do you remember? He was named Man of the Millennium by Time Magazine. Isn't that, isn't that funny? Time Magazine... For the year 1000 to 2000, he said, for those 1000 years, the most important person, Johann Gutenberg. Why? Of course, he invented the printing press, the movable type in the printing press. Why did he invent that? What was his stated reason? Do you know? So he could mass produce the Word of God. That's why he did it. That's his stated reason. The first thing he printed off that printing press was Scripture. Uh, so, Johann Gutenberg. Thank him that we now have English Bibles in our hand. A third man, very significant in this process, William Tyndale. Uh, 150 years after Wycliffe. Think about this. So, so Wycliffe did his English Bible. By the way, Wycliffe's Bible was based off of the Vulgate. So it wasn't based off the original languages. So it was pretty inferior. 
but really great that you can have an English, I mean something, uh, but it was inferior compared to what William Tyndale did 150 years later where he translated from the original languages. However, he was also an Oxford man, he was also Cambridge trained, uh, but he was kicked out of England. He was, uh, he was forced out. Because at that time, I, I, I have to get, go further into my understanding of, it's in, interesting to, to read in England uh, how at times they were under uh, more of a Catholic uh, monarchy and at other times it was more of a Protestant monarchy. And, you know, depending on who was in power, you might, you might be doing really well if you're Protestant under the Protestant one, but you could get your head lopped off if it ended up being, a, you know, that's where we get Bloody Mary from. Uh, anyway, uh, how am I getting so far afield? Let's get back to William Tyndale. Um, so obviously there was a th strong Catholic strain at that time. They didn't want uh, the Bible translated into English. And really part of it is, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So, but they forced him out, so he went to Hamburg, Germany. That's where he ended up translating uh, the, the scriptures into English. Um, and the scriptures would be smuggled into London because they were contraband. They were illegal. Um, finally, he was captured, strangled, and burnt at the stake. Uh, but here was a man whose vision, his dream was, quote, that even plowboys should have the word of God. Who cares? I mean, what, what does it matter? I mean, does it matter what William Tyndale did uh, five, six hundred years ago? It took a revolution. And a lot of people who gave their lives so that you and I could read Scripture in our own language. The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, they wanted to have control over people. They didn't want people, the average Joe, to be able to read scripture for themselves and decide for themselves what it says. So we want to be under control of the Catholic Church. Uh, but people like this said, no, that's not right. God's word needs to go out all people. All people need access to this book. And really that's the ethos of this, of this seminar series. The whole point of this is you can read God's word for yourself. You don't need someone else to tell you what it says. You can read it. You can understand it. Um, which brings us to the King James Version, certainly the most significant English version for 350 years. Uh, there were, the, the issue that King James came upon is there was all kinds of different versions going on. And so King James says, you know what, we need an authoritative version. By the way, authorized version, that's an early title. We need an authorized version of the Bible. We need something authoritative. And so he gathered up, he made a list of 54 translators slash uh, revisers, theologians, who could be part of a committee to translate from the Greek and Hebrew into English. Uh, and that was in 1604 that he made this list of folks. Not all of them, I think it was more like 47 who ended up being a part of the translation of the King James. A few of the early editions had some errors, as you can imagine, writing a whole, translating a whole Bible, uh, you're going to have some things. Uh, for example, there's the infamous 1611 He and She Bibles, where just one little word in Ruth changed from He to She, so instead of referring, uh, uh, anyway, uh, there, there was also the, the so-called Wicked Bible of 1631, and it really was a Wicked Bible, because it omitted one little word from Exodus 2014. Do you know what that word was? It was not. It omitted the word not in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So, as you can understand why it was called the Wicked Bible, it actually read thou shalt commit adultery. Um, so, that, that, so, interesting, if, as you read the history of the King James, very interesting things happen along the way. But it was the preferred version for Protestants for 350 years, which is pretty astounding for it to hold sway uh, for that long. Uh, in the 60s, uh, about 50 years ago, we began to see a lot of new modern translations popping up. And so we have a lot of translations now that are written. And by the way, some of these translations um, 
they've also gone through and they're based on even more recent understandings. For example, when the King James were written, they didn't have the Dead Sea Scrolls to help us understand what the original words of the Hebrew were. And so there are a number of things that took place since King James was written, and so we benefit from uh, those greater understandings of what the text is. Um, now here's the thing. We have a lot of different versions, and I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, and, you, and you go, well, how can I choose a version? The one thing that I want you to understand is the significant uniformity of modern English translations. And sometimes people argue, oh, this Bible or that Bible. Just, just watch one verse. I just took one verse. I just pull, pulled one verse out to say, well, let's see what it says in, all, in a number of different translations. So the verse I chose was Romans 6.1. Uh, and it was only because when I did this seminar, when I originally put it together 20-some years ago, I was really into Romans. I still am. I mean, Romans is really. But anyway, Romans 6 was my, was my key passage. I memorized it uh, when I was being discipled. But authorized standard version. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The British, it's, it's a British version. I can't remember the exact name here, BBE. What may we say then? Are we to go on in sin so that may, there may be more grace? Darby's version. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Uh, the International Children's Bible. So do you think we should continue sinning so that God will give us more and more grace? King James. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? New American Standard. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? New American Standard updated. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? I need to delete one of those. New International Version. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? New King James. What shall we say then? Shall we, go on, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? New Revised Standard. What then are we to say? Shall we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? The Living Bible. Well then, shall we keep on sinning so that God can keep on showing us more and more kindness and forgiveness? Weymouth version, to what conclusion then shall we come? Are we to persist in sinning in order that grace extended to us may be the greater? Young's literal translation, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin, the sin that the grace may abound? Now, why do I read all those to you? It's simply to make one small point. What's the difference in the message that's communicated in each of those different versions? Nothing. They're communicating the same thing. Every modern translation, just about every, now I mentioned like the feminist, but you know there are certain Bibles that are a little skewed, but every basically uh, main current modern translation from the King James to the New International Version, they are all good Bibles. It, they contain God's Word. So if you like one over the other, go ahead. It's just fine. Be careful about the New World Translation. That's a Jehovah's Witness version of the Bible. Now that one I can't recommend. And there are a number of other funky ones. But my point is here, all these books are great books. Now there's different, big differences in, in theory, and I'm just going to go really quickly here. Why, why are there so many different versions? Well, it's basically the difference between dynamic translation, which the goal is to communicate the basic thought, and literal translation, which focuses on trying to be word for word. Now you might think, well, word for word, isn't that better? Well, it can be, but sometimes the thing is Greek is written in a different way than English. They have a different understanding of word order. And so if you have a Bible like the New American Standard, it's a great example. New American Standard mimics the word order in the Greek, but as a result, it sounds really stilted sometimes. You kind of go, what? Because it's trying to mimic a different language. Um, and it doesn't translate as well into English. It's a great version. New American Standard, terrific Bible. And by the way, for a student of Greek, it's handy, or Hebrew, because it does mimic, it does follow the word order, so it's a little easier to follow along if you're reading in the original language. Um, but it doesn't always does as, do, do as great of a job as communicating the thought, which the New International Version, that's the big one that that originally and has become most popular that focused on communicating not just the words but the thought that's trying to be communicated even if it meant moving the word order a little bit around to make it more more sense of it and so here if you want to look at a, at a kind of a continuum of more dynamic or more literal translations the living bible very dynamic you know it's, uh, it takes a lot of liberties niv new american standard 
King James, and then no one uses Young's literal translation, but I, I, I enjoyed it in my Bible program, once again, because he gives a, basically a word-for-word -word kind of rendering. Um, the question is, what makes a good translation? And that's a question that I'm not going to spend any more time on. So, you can, so I'm just going to blip through these really quick. You can look at these later. Don't write any of these things down. It's not really that significant. But the point is, um, what can is it based on? Obviously, if it has the Apocrypha, no Apocrypha, New Testament only. Uh, what text is it based on? Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to discuss those. Philosophy of translation, whether it's more the formal equivalency, the word for word, or whether it's dynamic equivalency, which is as free as necessary, as faithful as possible. That's a, I think that's the NIV's motto, uh, New International Version. Uh, assumed English competence, some, like the Living Bible, assumes a higher reading level. So even though it's more informal in its language, it also assumes an 11th grade reading level, whereas the NIV, for example, assumes an 8th grade reading level. Contemporary English version, a 3rd grade reading level. Um, so this is just to show, these are some of the differences you have in the Bible. Single versus double columns, red letter editions, large print. Here's the only thing that I will tell you about editorial features. Any Bible you get, the one thing that I highly recommend you, you look for to have in any Bible you have is that it has cross-references. Cross-references for studying God's Word are very significant. Now, we won't get that till, till the third seminar, okay? In the third seminar, we'll talk about why cross-references are so significant. But if you're buying a Bible, the one thing I always encourage people to do, and I have this, my preaching Bible that I use, it doesn't have, does not have cross-references. I don't study out of this book. I, I use it to preach. Um, but the Bibles I do any study out of, they always have cross-references. Which is basically, so if you read a passage and it says, this is also referenced in you know, Habakkuk. So you can go back and say, oh, this is what, where it's quoted from. You know, that's the purpose of cross-references. So that's the one editorial feature um, that, I, that I highly encourage you to make sure that your, your Bible has. Study helps. Uh, manuscript, variants, uh, you know, maps, concordances, and cross-referencing. That's, that's where I was talking about study helps. Notes, introduction. You know, the notes at the bottom of the NIV, study Bible, for example, they're great. It's great. I encourage you to do, don't rely on those notes. They are not, uh, they're not inspired. They're not inerrant. They're just people's understanding of what they think it means. Focus on the, on the text that's up here at the top. <laughs> you know, Focus on the Word of God. That is what's inerrant. That's what's inspired. So it's fine to have a study Bible that has lots of different explanations. Just make sure you don't, you don't get off, sidetracked by all those things as opposed to focusing on what's actually in the Word of God. Uh, specialty Bibles. There's, you can get a charismatic Bible, a children's Bible, gender. You know, there are so many different kinds of Bibles you can get these days. There's been lots of discussion about gender neutral. I'm not even going to worry about that tonight. You can ask me if you have any questions about that, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but basically, we come down to this. What are the implications of what we're talking about here? It's God's Word. Read it. That's really the point of all this. It's God's Word. Read this book. Read this book. Um, and just a quick preview of what we're looking at as we move ahead here. Um, do you know what the Tanakh is? I know a number of you have been to some of these seminars. You've heard me talk about the Tanakh. We're going to talk about the Tanakh in the next seminar. Um, it's the Hebrew ordering of the scriptures that I've talked about. And I mentioned, by the way, I'm reading through the Old Testament myself right now in the Tanakh form, the Hebrew form of the Old Testament scriptures. And I'm loving it. I'm loving it. But anyway, uh, Bible survey, that's what our next one is as well. So not only do we look at the Hebrew, but we look at the entire Bible. We'll do a survey of the, the entire Bible. Um, the, the, the third seminar, we'll look at Bible disciplines, how you can study the Bible for yourself, how to study the Bible, how God's Word applies to me. And so those are some of the things we're going to look at upcoming. Any significant, and I, I want to just focus right now on any questions, anything that you read and you go, I, I didn't get that. I didn't understand that. Any questions that you have about what we've covered tonight? All right. Well, you're welcome to follow up with me later if you have, if anything occurs to you. Thank you all for coming. We moved quickly, but hopefully uh, some of it stuck and was beneficial. Let's close our time the way we started it, shall we? Lord, we thank you so much just for the blessing of being able to come together and study your word to learn about this great book that you've given us. 
And we pray, God, that the end result will be that we will be all the more challenged and encouraged to, to eat, to take and eat this rich, nutritious, wonderful book that teaches us about you. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen.